It seems Christopher Monckton has responded to my video series about him, sort of. On the website What's Up With That, he replied not directly to the videos, but to a loose summary of them that someone had posted. What made Monckton's response interesting is that it wasn't really a rebuttal at all, but for the most part an astonishing climb-down in his position, and even outright denial of what he said. Once again, this needs very little comment from me, because Monckton is extremely good at debunking himself. Just watch. First up, the claim that Monckton was Margaret Thatcher's science advisor. I did advise Margaret Thatcher on many scientific and other matters, including climate change. He may well have done, who knows, but that doesn't make him Margaret Thatcher's science advisor, and that's the claim that's being made by his supporters. I refuted Monckton's claim that he'd written a peer-reviewed paper, and he responded, As was usual for physics and society at the time, the journal's review editor, Professor Alvin Saperstein, reviewed the paper. But that's routine editing, Mr. Monckton, which every submission to the newsletter goes through. It's not the same as peer review. Physics and Society itself says it's not a peer-reviewed journal. It's a forum for letters, commentary, book reviews, and non-peer-reviewed articles. Surely anyone who understands scientific publishing knows the difference. So my rebuttal of your claim is correct. What about Monckton's claim that the Earth has been cooling? In 2008 I said the Earth had been cooling since the turn of the millennium on 1st of January 2001. So it had, at that time. Do the linear regression for yourself and see. Recent warming, however, means that there's been little change in temperature since 2001. No need to tell us what you said, Mr. Monckton. Here's what you actually said. And what that looks to me like is a fairly hefty, and indeed it is, statistically significant rate of fall. But of course, cherry-picking start and end points over such a short period of time is not any kind of guide to long-term temperature change. In statistical parlance, any temperature decline you might have cherry-picked from the graph is not statistically significant. Of course, Moncton claimed that it was. Statistically significant rate of fall. But here's someone who contradicts him. There has been a fall trend in temperatures. It's not at present a statistically significant fall. Who's the mystery rebutter? Why, it's Moncton himself. This is what I'll call the Moncton Maneuver, a subtle change in position whenever he gets caught out or realises he's made a mistake. I'll let the two Monctons argue about whether Moncton's trend is statistically significant or not. As we saw in my video, real climate scientists all agreed that the trend is up and Moncton can't show where their analysis is wrong. On overall melting of the Greenland ice cap, Johannesson et al., whom I cited, reported a substantial net accumulation of snow, fern and ice on Greenland from 1992 to 2003. As I said, no he didn't. Here Moncton is simply repeating his claim, even though I showed Johannesson's paper, which Moncton cites, showing the complete opposite to what Moncton claims. How much clearer can that be? But Moncton simply repeats the claim as if repeating it will magically make the paper change its text. But if Moncton ever does get around to realising his mistake by checking Johannesson's paper more closely, watch out for the next Moncton manoeuvre. My bet is he'll quietly eliminate the word net from his claim. As for no systematic loss of ice in the Arctic, well, before I show Moncton's response to this one, let's just listen again to what he said. So we're not looking at a, a sort of long-term systematic loss of ice in the Arctic. As always, the best person to contradict this claim is Moncton himself. Look for the Moncton manoeuvre buried inside his response. Arctic ice has certainly declined ever since the satellites have been watching. Yes, exactly. So there is a long-term systematic loss of ice in the Arctic, which is exactly what glaciologists and climatologists have been saying and which Moncton previously denied. So we're not looking at a, a sort of long-term systematic loss of ice in the Arctic. Next, Moncton's claim that there's no correlation between CO2 and temperatures over the past 500 million years. Moncton responds, There has indeed been a remarkable correlation between CO2 and temperatures over the past 500 million years. What? You've been arguing all along that there was no correlation. Oh, it's another Moncton manoeuvre, so let's just go back to what you told your audiences repeatedly just a couple of years ago. Here we get uh, a rather prodigious mismatch again. 
uh, between CO2 concentration, which is the black line, and temperature con concentration, which is the blue line, going right back to almost 600,000 years into the controversial oh. is that, again, it doesn't show a terribly good link between the two. And look at how little correlation there is in that graph between temperature in blue there and CO2 concentration in black. Now Moncton quietly drops that claim altogether and brazenly tells us the complete opposite. Next, a Precambrian ice planet shows that CO2 has no effect on the climate. OK, Moncton goes into a rather long and boring dissertation on this, but here's the main point. The reasonable point that I made, quoting Professor Ian Plymer, a geologist who has made a particular study of the period, was that even allowing for the fact that the sun was 5% fainter in the Neoproterozoic than today, and for the fact that the planet's albedo was much greater than now, Equatorial sea level glaciers could not have come and gone twice if CO2 had had the very large warming effect that is now imagined. Moncton ignores real research, which I cited, showing that carbon dioxide played a crucial role in unlocking the Earth from a global glaciation. The question I asked in my video was, if the Earth was effectively deep frozen with glaciers at the equator and a much weaker sun, as Moncton agrees, and a high albedo that reflected most of the solar energy it did receive, how did the Earth emerge from this condition and turn into a hothouse, not just once, but perhaps two or three times? Moncton doesn't even try to answer this question. He simply repeats his belief that CO2 could not have unfrozen the Earth, but he gives no explanation for that belief. He says there's been no change in Himalayan glaciers for 200 years. There has. Let's just see where this claim comes from. They're doing fine, by the way. He's got 200 years of records from the days of the Raj when we first began monitoring these things, dead you know. And the glaciers are showing no particular change in 200 years. The only glacier that's declined a little is Gangotri, a very famous glacier, because there's been local geological instability, nothing to do with global warming. All the others are doing fine. Well, in the rebuttal, Moncton says something slightly different. The pattern of advance and retreat of the glaciers is as much as it has been over the past 200 years since the Raj first kept records. But that's not what Moncton told his audiences. He told them only one glacier had retreated a little. Astonishingly, Moncton has already done one Moncton manoeuvre on this when I questioned him about his sources, and he came up with the fact that Himalayan glaciers have been receding since the 19th century. Which of the three versions do you want to believe? Well, I'm not inclined to believe any of them, because this isn't a matter of belief, but of properly conducted studies, and nowhere does Moncton cite a single study except reference to his exchanges with Professor Batt, the man he claims is responsible for monitoring Himalayan glaciers. But Moncton doesn't rebut my revelation that Batt is not the person responsible for monitoring Himalayan glaciers. How do I know? Because Batt himself says so. What's Moncton's answer to this? None at all. And that takes us very neatly on to the next claim, which was that only one Himalayan glacier was retreating. Of course, now there's a Moncton manoeuvre on this. He now goes on to admit that many other glaciers are receding. And he says, merely because I mentioned one glacier is receding, it is not legitimate to infer that I said or implied that only one glacier was receding. The only glacier that's declined a little is Gangotri. But I'm not inferring it, Mr. Moncton. You said it quite clearly. The only glacier that's declined a little is Gangotri. If you can't even stand by your original claim, but exercise another slippery Moncton manoeuvre to deny you ever said it, then I guess the first Mr. Moncton was wrong, and my rebuttal of him is correct. Now Moncton's claim that CO2 forcing is 1.135 watts per square metre. Here's his response. A finding of low climate sensitivity in Linson suggests that the warming exercised by CO2 is equivalent to assuming a forcing of 1.135 watts per square metre. Again, never mind what you think you said or what you meant to say, Mr Moncton, here's what you actually wrote in your APS opinion piece. Forcing approximately equals 1.135 watts per square metre. I know, let's make it go away for a second and see if it changes into something else. Nope, he really did write that. And to substantiate the rest of my statement, climatologists, even the sceptics, all agree that the figure is in fact around three times higher. Even Linson, whose paper Moncton cites, puts the figure three times higher. 
so I don't know what else I have to do to show that my claim is correct. Now, of course, various factors might make it appear that forcing is less, but that's called sensitivity, which is something completely different. And that brings us on to the next Moncton error, that he confused forcing with sensitivity. I gave an explanation of forcing and sensitivity in one of my Moncton Bunkum videos. If you open all the windows on a cold night, it might appear that the output of a heater has been reduced, but that's an illusion. The heater's still pumping out the same amount of heat. It's how the house responds to that heat source that decides the ultimate temperature. It's summed up in this very well-known equation. If Moncton for some reason thinks the Earth is not responding to a CO2 increase in the way most climatologists conclude, what he should have done is reduce sensitivity by three. Nowhere in his what's up with that response does Moncton deny he mixed the two up. He just makes the most astonishing excuse for it, which is that it doesn't matter which you divide by three, it comes out to the same answer anyway. But even this excuse is belied by Moncton's belated attempts to cover up his mistake. In his opinion piece for the APS newsletter, he tells us quite clearly he divided forcing by three. But later he obviously realised his mistake, and in a response to critics tried to pretend he had divided sensitivity by three. This quiet reversal of position is the closest you'll ever get to an admission from Moncton that he made a mistake. He says a leading climate researcher found a loss of cloud cover is responsible for recent warming. She says it shows no such thing. Actually, what I showed in my video were three instances of Moncton citing a paper by Rachel Pinker and claiming that it demonstrated decreased cloud cover was responsible for recent warming. And I showed a statement from Dr Pinker explaining that her paper didn't demonstrate this at all and that Moncton was wrong. What's Moncton's rebuttal? OK, there is a bit of a Moncton manoeuvre here. He no longer asserts that warming is due to decreased cloud cover. It's now just a hypothesis. And it doesn't come from Dr Pinker or the paper. It comes from Moncton's interpretation of her paper. So who's right? Now, before anyone starts thinking that maybe Dr Pinker, despite 30 years as a researcher, is not very bright and might have made a mistake, let me just get a character reference from someone who may be familiar to you. He is wholly unconcerned with the global warming debate. It's as though he lives on another planet. He lives for verifying whether satellites are doing their job. That's what Pinker is all about. Then my rebuttal of his claim obviously stands. Dr Pinker does indeed say that Moncton is wrong. Now, I never said Moncton misquoted scientists to mislead his audience, but I did show how he changed quotes in order to support his arguments. Moncton responds, no instances are given to support this libel, so I cannot comment. But of course instances are given very clearly. What you'll read next are the actual quotes, and what you'll hear are Mr Moncton's misquotes. There has been no global warming for a decade. We cannot explain why. It is a travesty that we can't. And he said, the Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. Unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. If Mr Moncton thinks I'm being libelous by showing him publicly giving altered versions of these quotes, great, sue me, and I'll be happy to produce all of this evidence in court. Moncton said planets with a high albedo are cooler than planets with a low albedo. Now, Moncton starts off his response with the carefully chosen words, if all other parameters be held constant. Now, this is correct, but Moncton didn't tell his audiences that. He didn't tell them that in order to make this conclusion, one has to strip away a planet's atmosphere. So a planet with an atmosphere is going to behave completely differently. And our planet does have an atmosphere. So what he told the audience was wrong. And by using the Moncton manoeuvre to add the unassuming phrase, if all other parameters be held constant, Moncton accepts that what he said was wrong. Moncton gets information in peer-reviewed science papers wrong. And he responds, not a single instance is cited. This is pure yabu. Of course an instance is cited, Mr Moncton. Several instances are cited. I cited your misquote of a paper by Scafetta and West. And of course I cited Johannesson and a paper by Sammy Solanke et al. He says some planets are warming because of the sun. No, they're not. Again, I didn't write this, someone put this on the forum, and it isn't really even a paraphrase of what I said, but Moncton's response is interesting anyway. 
There has indeed been evidence of simultaneous warming in many planets of the solar system, and I have mentioned this. Well, that's true. However, given the difficulties of reliable measurement and imaging, I have not sought to draw definitive conclusions about the role of the sun in global warming from such observations. Really? At the moment, the polar ice caps of Mars are melting. There has been warming noticed on the surface of Jupiter, on one of the moons of Neptune, even on far distant Pluto, all at the same time. And why is this? Because astronauts are taking their 4 by 4s up into space? No, it's because the Sun, as we'll see, has been remarkably active. I can't add to this except to say another Moncton manoeuvre. Moncton is now completely denying something he said in front of audiences and even filmed for distribution. He said that the International Astronomical Union has declared the sun is responsible for the recent warming. It didn't. And Moncton responds, I cited a paper given by Dr. Habibulo Atusamatov at the 2004 Symposium of the IAU in St. Petersburg, Florida, but put IAU at the foot of the slide rather than Dr. Abdusamatov's name. Well, I'd say that was a mistake because Dr. Abdusamatov is clearly not the International Astronomical Union. And Moncton seems to make a habit of replacing the name Dr. Abdusamatov for the International Astronomical Union. Now, to slip up on a name once is perhaps understandable. To continue to do it is astonishing. Most solar physicists agree. The International Astronomical Union in 2004 had a symposium on it. They concluded that that was the case. And these, this is not my conclusion. This is the conclusion of the International Astronomical Union Symposium in 2004. This is what they said. The sun caused today's warming. Today's warming is normal. Well, that covers all the responses. I'll have to put my conclusions in the second part of this video.